So I want to introduce you to three people. Uh, we've got Sean, we've got Margo, we've got Karen. They look like sort of youngish people, having fun. They're going to work, we'll imagine. Uh, one day they're sitting, uh, Karen, you can see, is adjusting the, uh, the radio station. They're having a good time. And then, boom. They get hit from behind. All three were in the same vehicle. So let's start with a question like this. Let's imagine that all three of these people within two days come and present to you, and they're complaining of some degree of neck and shoulder girdle pain and some neck stiffness. Knowing nothing more than what I've given you so far, will they recover? Which is a lot of time what people want to know, isn't it? Am I going to get better? And if so, how long is it going to take? What do we know? What information have you already got that can help you start to answer this question? You want to take a, take a stab? Unfortunately, I've got bright lights in my eyeballs, so I'm not going to be able to see everybody, but just yell it out. What do we know? How long, what do we know about recovery from these kinds of acute traumas? Gender might have an influence. Okay. We, yep. What else do we know? Age. Age might have an influence. Great. What else do we know? Litigation might have an influence. Sure. What else do we know? Let's how about this how, lo how long will it take question. How long does it take to recover from this kind of thing? I'm sure your patients ask you this umpteen times a day. What's your answer? It depends. Do you, do you actually give them the it depends? And do you, do you explore the dependencies? <laughs> That'd be cool if you did. So I heard six weeks, people sort of, I, I think I heard a whisper uh, of that. I know it's early, nobody wants to say too much. That sounds about right. Okay, that's fine. So I would argue that a lot of patients actually want to know this, this, these pieces of information, don't they? Before they even want to know what can I do about it myself, they're really coming into you to say, am I going to get better? If so, how long will it take? And if you can confidently say, you're going to get better, I see no reason to think that it's not going to take longer than average, here's average time for recovery, do you want to carry on with treatment or not? Now that becomes a patient's decision. On the other hand, if you're able to confidently say, well, we know average recovery takes this long. Based on the things I've seen today, it seems as though if we don't intervene now, there's a risk you're going to take longer than that. Would you like to explore those interventions? So I think this is a good way of going about things. So I'm really strongly endorsing in the acute stage a prognosis-based approach to assessment. So what do we currently know? What are we able to say with reasonable confidence? Well, I'm going to start with a paper from 2010 that Michelle Sterling and her group, Justin Canardi, out of the University of Queensland did on 155 people with acute whiplash-associated disorder. And they explored recovery trajectories, and in this case, they defined recovery using the Neck Disability Index. Now, how many people here are familiar with the NDI, the Neck Disability Index? That's what I figured. Great. Okay, so I don't need to explain it. What they found is that within their group of 155 people, they identified three recovery trajectories. There's a group on the very bottom here, and they call that the mild group. This is a group that doesn't score very high on the NDI to begin with. They improve fairly rapidly, and I'm not sure if I have a little laser pointer here. I don't think so, but you can see around that three-month mark, you can see sort of a little elbow there. Right? So the, the first 12 weeks or so, they, they improve fairly rapidly, and after that, they're pretty well recovered. There's a moderate group there of around 39 or 40% of people. They start a little bit higher. Again, they improve fairly rapidly. Again, you can see a little bit of a of an elbow around the three-month period. And then from there on, they're fairly stable. And then there's this chronic severe group, that upper group. And these are the ones I think we really need to be concerned about. Now, it's not a huge group, 15 or 16 percent. But they're ones who start quite high on the NDI, and they don't really improve a whole lot. What I would suggest is that if we can identify these three trajectories accurately and reliably, then the people in the lowest group are probably the ones that don't really need a whole lot of our help. They're the ones that we can say, yeah, but I don't see any reason why you're not going to recover. We anticipate you should get better within 6 to 12 weeks. If you want some, some treatment suggestions, I can give them to you, but otherwise I can follow up with it in a couple weeks to make sure you're improving the way I think you're going to. But those middle two, that moderate and that upper one, those are the ones we want to be able to identify, of course, because I think those are the ones that require our care. Now, it's nice to see consistency in these sorts of things. So they also looked, for example, at measuring outcome not just by virtue of neck disability index, but also post-traumatic stress. And once again, three different trajectories. So there seems to be some kind of mutual maintenance between post-traumatic distress 
and neck-related disability. And we're going to come back to this comment in here just a minute. Now here's one I want to show you from a project that we're currently working on. This is a project called the Symbiome Study. And in this study, I have a research assistant who sits in our acute emergency care uh, center at St. Joseph's Hospital here in town. And as people walk through the door who have had what we're calling non-catastrophic musculoskeletal injuries, so these are people who don't require surgery, don't require hospitalization, he captures right then and there from them some markers of pain and distress, takes blood, takes saliva, sends them off with a baseline set of questionnaires, and we follow up with them 1, 3, 6, and 12 months later. We so far got 101 people through this, uh, up to six months. And my outcome here is something called the Satisfaction and Recovery Index. Now, this is a tool that I created a few years ago. It's, it's been published. You can find it actually on uh, my lab's website if anybody wants to use it. But it measures importance-weighted health-related satisfaction. So it's basically more of a patient-centric uh, scale. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. If we go back to Michelle's trajectories, we see a 45 39, 16% trajectory. We found almost the exact same thing. In this case, a higher number is better. You're more satisfied. But look at that, 15, 41, 44%. Almost exactly the same trajectories. And now this is a mixed cohort. These aren't just people with whiplash-associated disorders. Some are. These are people with wrist and ankle injuries, knee injuries, shoulder injuries, low back injuries. Love to see a little bit of overlap in that. And in fact, if we look to the low back pain literature, oh, sorry, actually, wait, before I get to that, um, this was one that we did a few years earlier. In fact, I think someone in, a couple people in here might have been involved in this study. Uh, looking at neck pain outcomes following rehab, we only did it over four weeks. But yet again, three trajectories, and again, that worst trajectory, 14, 15%. Pretty consistent. We look at low back pain, it's a little bit messy because this was a, a large group of people. But again, looking for trajectories of recovery, if we look at the very bottom group, complete recovery or mild episodic pain in 24%, and yet again, that high, severe, ongoing group, in this case, 18%. So we're seeing some consistencies here. What do we know about recovery? No matter how we slice it, we know that somewhere in 15 to 20% of people are going to continue to report severe, significant interfering problems. We also know that somewhere around, let's say, 25 to 40%, are going to get better regardless of what we do, maybe even despite what we do. And then there's a middle group that's still a fairly big gray zone. So the next question is, can we predict these? Can we predict these trajectories? And I've just pulled this out. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the uh, APTA clinical practice guidelines for neck pain because Anita and I are going to be talking about it um, in our next session, so I don't want to steal a whole lot. But I'll, this is the only one I will use. This is some of the prognostic indicators or risk factors for chronic pain that we found as part of that clinical practice guideline development. And they're pretty consistent. They're things that you've probably heard before. So people with high pain intensity at baseline, and we're able to usually identify high pain intensity as about 6 out of 10 or higher. People with high self-reported disability, so high NDI scores at baseline, again, they're around 30% or higher. High pain catastrophizing, high acute post-traumatic distress, there's that post-traumatic distress thing again, and cold hyperalgesia, which is probably the last I'm going to say about cold hyperalgesia today. We're not really sure what it means, but for some reason, a subgroup of these folks are really hypersensitive to cold, and that seems to earn them membership to that sort of high-risk group. Not sure what that means, what you would do about it, but it is what it is. <laughs> 